So on, so we're going to read it together. Psalm 127, a song of degrees for Solomon. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Amen. Ending there at the end of the psalm, trusting the Lord will encourage us as we meditate upon it. Let's unite together momentarily in prayer. Lord, we come to Thee so thankful again for the fact that We are in thy hand and we come to a sovereign God and one who is in control of every affair and every detail. Even as we see the news and the turmoil and the unrest that's all over the world, yet we're glad to know that there is one king that is supreme over all other kings, one Lord that is supreme over all other lords. We ask that thou wilt help us ever to rest in thy sovereignty, to rest in all thy goodness and to know that we are thy people And thou art our God. Bless us tonight as we consider thy word together and draw us after thyself. We pray for hearts that will run, that will be swift to flee to Christ and to him where his blood was shed. And may we ever serve him and do everything we can to magnify him. Draw us now closer to thyself through the word. And may the spirit of God mediate blessings to us. And may there be even signs following the preaching of the word in the hearts of each of us gathered In Jesus' name, amen. If you read carefully through this psalm, you will find that there is presented before us a balance that needs to be struck in the Christian life between hard work and faith in God. It's very easy to be unbalanced in this regard. We are told, I think, that at least by implication, that work without trust shows a spirit of self-sufficiency and that faith in God without work shows a sinful spirit of presumption and there needs to be this middle ground whereby that we work but not self-sufficiently and that we rest in him and labor without realize, with realizing that he uses our work to uh, extend his kingdom and fulfill his ends. As believers, we ought to recognize that any genuine success that may come from any of our endeavors and I'm not just talking about spiritually, any labor that we do, anything that we see as successful that we can kind of say the Lord has rewarded here and his hand has been upon us, we recognize it has been the Lord. We must see that fundamentally it is all of the Lord. Jesus Christ taught very plainly in John 15 that without me he can do nothing. And this is to men that he had trained, men he had prepared, men he's about to unleash into the world as the leaders of the church, as the pillars of, 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 of taking the work forward. And these men are told, without me, you'll not do a thing. Without me, you'll accomplish zero. Without me, you might as well stop and give up before you even try. And so keeping the Lord central and realizing that everything is done by him through us is so fundamental to all of our work. If we forget that, we're inclined to pride or to say to God that he's to blame for our lack of success or whatever. We will have wrong views. What have we that we have not received, the Apostle Paul says, and that goes to every part of our living. Yet we also realize that God calls us to exercise our gifts, to exercise our talents and our abilities to his glory. And we must do that in the balance that's presented in this psalm. Now, each of us will naturally lean to extremes. We will feel more comfortable in one extreme, usually, than the other. And that's where we need to be very, very careful. Some will fall into the temptation that they're going to get something done with or without the Lord. (laughs) If the Lord's not involved in it, they're going to get it done anyway. And they'll just drive on. I know people like this. They tend to be very entrepreneurial, very driven, um, they, even within their work environment where they have control and they say, um, you know, give commands and orders and things are done, whatever, and there, there's a kind of a discipline and an orderliness and a, and a pursuit of a goal. 
And the Lord uses that without a shadow of doubt. Um, But they can fall into the temptation of, I'm going to make this happen whether or not it's the Lord's will. (laughs) It's my will and it's going to happen. That might be a tendency in in somewhere where we might lean, especially among leadership. It's very dangerous to have that kind of a spirit and drag a thing uh, kicking and screaming without the Lord's blessing in in a direction that we think it should go. Others, of course, and this perhaps is more prevalent, easily fall into idleness and carelessness and use the sovereignty of God as a ticket out of responsibility. Well, God's sovereign. If it's meant to be, it will be. That's true. But does that mean that I am to do nothing at all with the talents and the gifts that the Lord has given to me? Am I to waste away my life and the time the Lord grants to me as, and simply say, well, if it's to be, it will be. Uh, regardless of what I am to do. As I say, the psalm addresses these things, as we shall see, and it has a dual application in both home life and in church, church life. It's a psalm for the family. It applies to our own families, but it also applies to the church family, the church of the living God. I want us to consider this psalm this evening in light of the fact that we've come to the end of 2017. We are going to be uh, thinking about our own lives. I encourage that somewhat this morning. I think you should do that. I think you should evaluate 2017 if you haven't already. Look at yourself. Look at your life. Look at, again, as we used that text this morning and quoted it on several occasions, whether we have been rich toward God and in what way can we be richer toward God than we have been this year. All of that is important. But this psalm helps us, I think, to keep a balance in and, and how we evaluate the work of God here as a church as we go forward. So we're considering it under the title, A Church Dependent Upon God. A Church Dependent Upon God. We're taking the church angle, and it has that application, as I've already said. We're told in verse 1, let's break it down, let's look at what it says. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. He tells us from the outset that we can't build the house except the Lord build the house. So it's up to the Lord. Now, that being said, there is an implication that we are also laboring, isn't there? That except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So it's not really saying there's anything wrong with those that are laboring to build it. They're doing their job. They're doing what they're meant to do. But their labor... The labor that they're exercising that they are meant to do, because this is what they're called to do, that labor won't come to anything. That's the point. It's not that they're laboring in something that they shouldn't be laboring in, but that the labor that they're expressing and exercising is pointless unless the Lord is with them. The language of the New Testament that the Apostle Paul uses that really fits with this is when he says that we are co-laborers together with God. Co-laborers. And I think that's expressed by the first verse of this psalm. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So the Lord's building and they're building and there has to be a coming together. Co-laborers together with God. This is essential. Without the Lord, all that we do is vain. That's what it says. It's futile. It will not come to anything. And, of course, this has to be weighed in the balance of eternity because that's really when everything is tested. It's not tested in time, really. At least it's not expressed like it will be in the life to come. When our works, as I said this morning, they follow us and we will be judged and they will be tested by fire, according to Paul's writings. And we will see our works, particularly those engaged in any form of ministry, Uh, He's using it in application to those in the ministry. I think it probably can be extended to all of us. And what we do, it will be tested. It will be evaluated by God. And there will be things that we have done, things we've spent time doing, and we will find that it's nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. And so, in the fire, it will burn up. Nothing will remain of it. It won't last. It won't have had any value or significance before God in light of eternity. On the other hand, other things will be gold, silver, and precious stones. And so when the fires come and burn at them, they only get more pure. This is how it will be for us in the life to come. And so, 
the, the warning is given to us right here in this psalm that there must be, there must be the Lord involved in everything that we do except the Lord build the house. They labor, those involved in the labor will do it in vain. This is such a sobering thing because so much of our lives are taken up with doing, aren't they? We're always doing something, going somewhere, engaged in whatever. And sometimes we can get discouraged and sometimes we can lose heart. Other times we can just get so caught up in what we're doing, we don't really evaluate whether or not we should be doing it. The psalm would help us to address this. I believe God blesses diligence. I do. I think the word of God is clear. Diligence is something that God um, exalts and appreciates and encourages that there ought to be labor. You think of Proverbs, I think it's chapter 6, going from memory, um, where we are called to consider the ant, thou sluggard, and to look at her and how she labors and how she works. And that's taken as a, a role model in nature of what we're to look at and consider the ant. Consider the ant. Consider how it works and labors and so on. And follow suit to a degree. See the preparation. See the diligence. See the hard work. And emulate it insofar as it would bring glory to God. The, apostle, uh, the apostles also have this kind of spirit as well. I think that is brought out very clearly when you read in Acts chapter 6. And you, know, you see that problem arise in the church. There's always problems in a church. It doesn't take... Uh, much for there to be problems in a church. These are growing pains, of course. The church is expanding, growing, advancing. And in the midst of that, this problem arises, whether or not it was a legitimate problem, whether or not the uh, Greek and uh, Gentile widows really had a reason to complain or whether they were just murmuring. Uh, I don't know. They may have had a reason for it. They may not. But whatever the case, the apostles look at the situation and they say, well, look, Choose you men who will deal with this. Deacons, as it really comes to be. Servants within the church. Appoint them, set them aside, and let them be over this business. But we, we apostles, will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, there's a whole lot in there. Much in there, in fact. Clearly, the apostles didn't want to be sidetracked. They had been given a specific mandate. And that was to preach the gospel to every creature. And they were, to, they, they were keeping in mind as they thought, well, maybe we should get involved in this. And others maybe coming and saying, no, this is not our calling. It's a good work. It's an important work. And we're going to choose out men. The church will choose out men full of the Holy Ghost to be over it, like Stephen and Philip and so on. But it's not for the apostles. It's not for them. So they say that, but it's not to escape work. It's not to escape work. The, the idea, without getting into it too deeply, the idea of giving ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word shows that labor that they were to give themselves to, that they were giving themselves, they were exerting themselves in a particular aspect, that here's the work, here's our responsibility, and we're exerting our energies in the word and in prayer. That's our responsibility. They were diligent, therefore. Paul's writings to Timothy show the same to labor in the word and to strive and so on. The, this kind of language is, is all throughout the word of God. So the Lord appreciates and encourages and would look for diligence. And yet diligence, for example, taking the apostles as what they say were word and prayer really are the, uh, the heart of their efforts and what they're to be engaged in. If they were to be diligent in prayer without diligence in the word, what would happen? Well, you would find that <laughs> the congregation wouldn't be fed, wouldn't be taught, wouldn't be built up in their most holy faith. They would have all sorts of problems. They may exhibit a certain level of spirituality. Indeed, indeed, they might go forward and sustain a certain momentum for a time. But without teaching, beloved, without teaching, there can be no foundation laid that will last through a lifetime. And that's what we do with our children. That's why we teach them and what we're really doing is laying a foundation that will last them through their lives. And whenever you're dealing with God's people, you're teaching them constantly so that they are building up a comprehension of the gospel 
So that while right now they may not really be in the furnace of the flick of affliction, right now they might not be in a strait or in a pickle. But when those times come, when the hard times come, and inevitably when we face death, as I have said to you before, the ministry of the church, the ministry of the word, part, a big significant part of the teaching of the word is that you live well and you die well. And teaching is essential to that. You will know it to be the case if you have been involved in any form of ministry and you're dealing with Christians, you will find that the Christians that struggle the most are the Christians that usually know the least. They just don't have the foundation there. But at the other side of the coin, diligence in the word without diligence in prayer will also not accomplish its proper end. It will fill minds with knowledge that will puff up rather than move hearts into the truth and that will establish them to live lives of humility and grace. So there must be a balance and the the apostles had to strike that balance. I don't know how they did it. I'm not sure how it all worked out for them. I do see the vast majority of the record of the book of Acts is they're preaching, them going, preaching, teaching, and also giving themselves to prayer, especially with the church, uh, giving themselves to prayer along with the people of God. There is a need for us then, beloved, to get this balance as individuals and as a congregation. I do not want to meet the Lord having lived in vain or been having given my efforts and my life to something that is vain. The world may look at what we do and say, what vanity. And I, I've heard what they say. I know what they say. I've, I've had it said to me and I've had it insinuated. <laughs> What's the point in God's work? What's the point in Christian ministry? What's the point in serving the Lord? Indeed, sometimes you will have your zeal questioned and people will have their reasons for that. Sometimes even within the church, even within the church, you will find criticism. What comes to mind is Leonard Ravenhill. May the Lord help me to remember this right. <laughs> Leonard Ravenhill, I wouldn't agree with him on everything theologically, far from it. But there's one thing you can say about Ravenhill. He had a heart for God. And Ravenhill <laughs> took things very seriously. And <laughs> as he said, he was, uh, he was only born and his parents had him in the prayer meeting uh, before he was a week old. I think, was it the next day? His, his, his mother took him to the prayer meeting? I'm not, something like that anyway. Certainly within a week. I can't remember exactly. It's in the beginning of his book on why revival tarries. And he saw that as his ministry, actually. And when he was getting involved in preaching, he realized that this isn't my ministry. I'm not called to teach and to preach. I'm called to pray. My ministry is prayer. And he was an evangelist, but his, his whole, the evangelism that he engaged in and his itinerant ministry was all based upon this prayer life. He gave himself to prayer. And he took things very seriously. We're talking this morning about living in light of eternity. Ravenhill lived in light of eternity. I think we could credit him with that. And he would talk about those that would say, you know, Leonard, you take things very seriously. You're all very, you're, you're very serious about these things. And, and he, he, was, he, he draws this picture of, of, of standing before God and standing before Christ in eternity and imagining the possibility that the Lord would say, Leonard, you took things too seriously. Never happen. So we look at our lives and we wonder about what we take seriously and whether or not we are doing things that are vain. I know that holiness is at the heart of all of this. I don't want to get sidetracked onto that, but I was, I was thinking this through. I was thinking, holiness is at its heart. The greatest work of each one of us is our pursuit of Christ's likeness. There's no higher calling. I said that a number of weeks ago. I say it again. To pursue Christ's likeness is the goal of Christ for his people. He wants us to be like himself. And that's going to happen one day. But it, even in this life, it is to be our goal. And so in all that we're pursuing, we might be involved in God's work. But if I'm an unholy man involved in God's work, I think most of my labor will 
will probably be in vain. If you're an unholy man or woman, and you're engaged in various work, the work that you're engaged in with your, with your children, you minister to your children. I mean, that, and just to say to moms and mothers, if you're a mother and you were once engaged in ministry, like some kind of church ministry and local church ministry, or you have ideas of being involved in that kind of ministry, and you'd have a heart for it, but you feel yourself tied to your children, do not, do not minimize the ministry with your children at all. That is your calling for this season of life, that you give your heart to your children, and you teach them, and they're around the skirts of your garments, and you teach them the word, and you talk to them about Jesus Christ. That is your calling. And the fruit of that labor, if it so pleases God to bless that work, (laughs) you'll be more happy that you give yourself to that than to anything else you will do. Believe me, loving our children and seeking to see them one for Christ is the calling of every mother and father. But as a church, I come back to this issue that... Look at this first verse. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. We are laboring. We are laboring in something. In our families or in the church family, we are laboring. And I find more and more that if my labor is not done constantly with the goal to be more like Christ and to labor for Christ and put Christ central in all things, that I will feel that labor to be utterly in vain. And I think that we will discover that to be the case. This is why Paul warns the church about sin and its effects with regard to the ministry of the Spirit within the church. So he says to the Thessalonians and to the Ephesians, language like grieve not the Holy Spirit or quench not the Holy Spirit. So there's a grieving of the Spirit and a quenching of the Spirit. And again, you can study that out for yourself, but why is that so important? If we grieve the Spirit, what are the implications? If we grieve the Spirit, does that stop me engaging in ministry? Probably not. If I grieve the Spirit, does that stop me exercising whatever are my daily duties? Probably not. Probably not. At least to a larger degree. Uh, uh, Mostly, I would imagine that we will still have our duties and we will do them. So why is it so important that I don't grieve the Spirit if I can still do the duty? If I can still do the work, if I can stand here and preach, prepare messages and preach to you and teach you and and minister to you, if I can do all that without any other aid as it seems, then what's the importance then? And I believe at the heart of it, beloved, is this. By sin that grieves and quenches the spirit, all our labor becomes vain. It is whenever we're bringing Christ into all things and living wholly onto Him in all that we do, feeble as our attempts may be, as we are giving our hearts to Him, wanting to be like Him, indeed at the very focal point of our lives, Lord, make me like Thyself, that He blesses the work of our hands, that our labor is not in vain. There's not one of us that can labor the way the Lord labored. <laughs> Remember what John said about him? For all the books, all the books in the world could not contain all that could be recorded about Jesus Christ. He was so industrious in such a short space of time. And so few of us are able to attain anything like that. But why do we labor? We must be careful about the focus of our labor. Jesus says, with regard to the church, if we take the angle of the the church family being built up, with regard to the church, Jesus says, I will build my church, Matthew 16. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build my church. I will build my family, we might say. I will build my family. So he's going to build his family. And the verb... The fact that he is building it is really important to notice. Because what he is doing is taking responsibility for the growth of his kingdom. He's saying the growth will be mine. I will do it. Now, 
he does this by the salvation of men and women, of course. First Peter 2, 5, he also as lively stones, living stones, are built up a spiritual house. He, he puts us in there. But there's a temptation for every church to talk about what we are doing for God. What we are doing. Here's what we are doing. <laughs> here's what we are involved in. Here's, here's, it's about us. And when it comes to the language that is used in Scripture about the church and the church going forward, the verbs aren't ours to perform. Now, there are some of things for us to do. We are to preach. That's okay. We're to preach. We're to teach. We're to pray. But the building, the building, and the, listen, it's the building that everyone's interested in, isn't it? Isn't it? It's not what we want to see. We want to see growth. No one, no one really, there's less of an interest in the hidden things, the things that aren't seen, the things that aren't, that you can't, can't kind of see and, and, and quantify and, and number. <laughs> we want to put numbers on everything. We do. We want to put numbers on everything. I'm the same. I come to the end of the year and I'm, I'm, I'm just letting you into my mind. I'm wondering, you know, like uh, right now I have an expectation on Sunday morning there should be this number of people there. And it's not about the numbers. It's about, well, these people say they are part of this church, so I expect them to be there. And if they're not there, then they're one of a number that are missing. And why are they missing? And that's not good for their souls. Anyway, but there's a number that naturally comes out of that. And more and more as I go on, I, I, I completely don't think of the number as, as the goal itself. I really do, and the Lord has been very gracious to help me with that. It's not about that. Yet, I still, I look back, and I wonder, well, 12 months ago, what was the number I was expecting to see on a Sunday morning? And is it more, though? And how much more is it? And you think these things, and you wonder about it. And, and then I come back, and I wonder, well, is that the building? Is that all the building? That's part of the building. Clearly it is. There's an emphasis of it in the book of Acts. That they, they, they were, the number of them were multiplied, and there was 3,000 converted, and there was 5,000 converted. And someone was counting. Someone was counting. Someone was saying, 3,000 received, and probably, I don't know, membership list, some understanding of who it is. Here's the church. The 3,000 converted on this day, along with the others that are there. Another 5,000. The word of God increased. The number of the disciples multiplied. Someone's counting. Someone's seeing the growth of the church, and it's numerical. That's undeniable but there's more to it than that and the point is that the building doesn't belong to us that's the point I can't build the church if I do it will be in vain now I do things that contribute to the building again look at verse 1 except the Lord build the house that's what Jesus said he would do the Lord build the house I will build my house. I will build my church. They labor in vain that build it. Do we build it? We do. We do things that help build it. But we are not the builders. And that is really important to understand. Look at verse 2 as well. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Here he uses the word again. It is vain for you. Something else is vain. We labor in vain if we don't have the Lord helping us in our building. But it's also vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late. The vanity of trying to do things in the flesh. Now you will know back in those days they didn't have electricity. And back in those days they labored according to the light of the sun. That's what they did. So... While the sun was rising, especially in that part of the world where you're near the equator and you can most times of the year there's not much variation in the time of sunrise and sunset and so you begin the day at six and you end the day at six. Prior to that, it's too dark to do anything. After that, it's too dark to do anything. You, can, you, have, a, you have a timeline. You have, you have a slot of the day. You have the 12 hours and you labor in those 12 hours. Anything you need to do has to be done then. Light dictated working hours. In other words, God's providence in those affairs dictates working hours. And the language shows, 
an artificial and fleshly effort to try and lengthen the day in order to get more done. And God says it's vain. It is vain for you to rise up early. To get up earlier to get more done. Vanity. To sit up late. Vanity. You're sitting up late for the purpose of getting more done. Vanity. And what happens is you eat the bread of sorrows. What does that mean? That you realize that in all you're getting up early and you're sitting up late to accomplish an end isn't helping. <laughs> it's not helping. It's like those who think that it benefits them to work seven days a week. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. And you will find that you will suffer greatly if you try to work seven days a week. It's not the will of God for your life. He giveth his beloved sleep. It is vain for you, therefore, to extend working hours, to imagine yourself to be like God, able to work 24-7 all the time. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late. <sighs> Again, we like to think that some of us, some of us, if I labor harder, more will get done. If I labor longer, more will get done. Often that's not the case at all. If you're missing sleep, you will find that your productivity dips seriously. You can be up longer and getting less done. And everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. I'm learning it. <laughs> I'm still trying to learn it. <laughs> I've been a long time trying to learn it. I was reading David Murray recently and David Murray is you know, talking about this issue about get your sleep, get your sleep, because it doesn't help if you're working beyond hours of, of normal working time. Get your sleep. And it's true. It really is true. And that's reflected here in the psalm. It is vain. There's no point in it. Don't rise up early and sit up late and think you'll get more done. You won't. You'll only end up more sad because not any more is getting done. There's less uh, perhaps getting done. You'll eat the bread of sorrows. And so we're reminded that our plans in the flesh are a waste of time. We may do more and achieve less if we do not have the Lord with us. We can toil and labor in the flesh and labor in worry and trouble. Eat the bread of sorrows. That is laboring, laboring in this labor and not accomplishing any more. You know, my mind goes to a passage. I just want to, because this, this, this highlight, this is a good illustration of it. If you try to find Haggai, I don't know how good you are at finding the, the minor prophets, but if you, if you go to Haggai, go to the minor prophets, and maybe you can find Zechariah easier and work back from there. Uh, Haggai chapter 1. This is helping us to evaluate our labor and what we do from one year to the next. In Haggai chapter 1, the people have been brought out of exile. The Lord has been merciful to bring them back in. And they start well. They start well. But it's really interesting what the Lord says here. We'll read from verse 2. Haggai chapter 1 verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Or that the Lord's house should be built. In other words, it's not the time to build the Lord's house. That's not the time for it. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie in waste? Is that, what, is that the time? You build up your own homes and let the Lord's house go to waste? Now therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Consider your ways. And here we get an insight into the providence that had unfolded in their lives as they labored to build up their own little homes and empires. And again, this ties into so much of what we said this morning, not being rich toward God. And here's the summary of the Spirit of God through the prophet of their experience up until this point because they had neglected God's work and God's kingdom. He have sown much and bring in little. You're out sowing, sowing, sowing. You bring in little. You eat but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. <laughs> this is vanity. This is vanity. What you're giving yourself to now isn't accomplishing anything. 
And you don't see it. And so the Lord comes and says, consider your ways. You're laboring. You're laboring, but it's with the wrong emphasis. You need to evaluate the emphasis of your labors. I am calling you, build my house, build my kingdom, make a place for me where you can meet with me and worship me. And so he says again in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. So vanity. (laughs) How we can have such vanity in the work, laboring and nothing coming to pass. We need to trust the Lord that he will build his work and yet do what we are called to do. I think I've overemphasized perhaps that point a little much, uh, too much this night. But just to see, he is the builder of the church. He builds. We're involved in the work. We have responsibilities, but he builds the work. Secondly, he is the protector of the church. He is also the protector of the church. Go back to Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, the labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Those of you who come to the prayer meeting will know that I quote this fairly regularly and more regularly than I do publicly at home. I go over this psalm regularly all the time because it summarizes so much about what needs to be done, not just in the building of the church and the positive development, but the preserving of the church so that it's not uh, undermined by anything that creeps in. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Again, there's this idea of something being vain unless the Lord is involved. You can go forward and the church can be built and there can be advancement and the Lord can be in it and you can have periods of extreme growth where you can say, it seems as if I do half of what I did before, but three times the productivity. Or I'm doing exactly the same as what I did before, but what's happening is, is, is different. D.L. Moody had that experience. He said, I was preaching the same sermons, but what was happening was, was not the same. Extraordinary numbers coming to Christ. This is the Lord. This is the Lord. But... In all of that, there must be a work that the Lord does with us in keeping the city. Again, just because the Lord, we need the Lord to keep the city doesn't mean that we don't have a watchman. It doesn't mean that a city says, well, we are, we, we are the city of the Lord's and we, He'll preserve us and we don't need watchmen. That's not the point. You still have watchmen. You put watchmen on the towers. You have men appointed to look out, to sound out the trumpet, to give warnings when necessary. But... You can have the watchman, and you can have him wake up in time, and you can have him see the enemy approach, and you can have him give plenty of warning, and it's all vain unless the Lord keeps the city. In the church, this is so important. Paul talked about this. He mentioned it in Acts chapter 20 to the Ephesian church, or the elders of the church at Ephesus And it's very pertinent what he says to them. I always imagine standing there that day. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, he meets with these elders, these elders of the church. And he says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Take heed to yourselves. That's the warning because of the responsibility you have. For I know this. I wonder what he knew. I wonder, did he know something specific? I always think of that when I read this. I wonder, did Paul know something, but he wasn't able to address it there and then. He could see the seeds of issues and problems. Or maybe he just knows that this is the devil's work, and I'm warning them. I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They will come in, and they will destroy the work of God. Also... Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Oh, did he look on in that congregation of elders, and he saw someone with a wrong spirit, someone who had an attitude that is about them, and they they thought themselves to be a better preacher than that guy, and they're going to try and draw disciples. There's an Absalom in the camp. He's going to draw away the hearts of the children of Israel away from David. Oh, maybe... Maybe, who knows? But what a warning he gives to them. Be careful. He is speaking, therefore, to the watchmen of the church. 
Grievous wolves enter in. Watch for the wolves. Among yourselves, others will speak perverse things to draw away disciples. These things will happen. And the psalmist writes, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh in vain. As I look back over this year, I think I can see the Lord has done this every single year since I've been here. I, I, I believe it, I could be wrong, but I think I have noted the Lord preserving the work. Preserving the work. There are details in that that I would never reveal to you. First, because I can never be certain. And secondly, because it's not important, really. But I know that the devil is constantly at work to, to destroy the church of God. You hear of things that happen within churches. This church has had its fair share of it in the past. Things happening. I was grieving to the heart. And every time something happens that destroys a work, it's because the Lord didn't keep the city. Of course, you have to ask, why? Why didn't the Lord keep the city? Well, that's another matter. But we are completely and utterly dependent upon the Lord to preserve the work, to keep the city. May the Lord ever do it here, to preserve the city. Remember the Lord, what he taught in Matthew chapter 13? And there were the, the tares were sown among the wheat. And those tares were sown in. And the word comes and says, an enemy hath done this. An enemy has done this. So there you have. And let both grow together until harvest. This is the difficult part, you see. It's so hard to identify the tares. It's not easy to see Judas Iscariot. It's not. That's why whenever one of you will betray me, is it I? <laughs> is it I? Judas isn't obvious. It's not obvious that it's Judas. It's it's really hard to see where Judas is going to come from. And for most men, it's impossible to see it. It's very difficult indeed. And that's why you need the Lord who's omniscient to know and to preserve the work of God. People come in. <laughs> I welcome everyone. And yet, I leave it to God to determine maybe that person isn't for here. Maybe they have a wrong motive. I could give you examples where I've seen those wrong motives come to the fore, where I've had to chase people. That's part of the work of a watchman. But the Lord ultimately has to keep the city. Thirdly, he is the multiplier of the church. He is the multiplier. He multiplies the church, doesn't he? In different ways. First, he adds more children. Verse 3, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. It's really great to hear that children are being born into the church. It's always a blessing. And children don't just belong to the parent. They are entrusted to the parent to care for them. And so whether it's children that are born into our families or people born of the Spirit into the church, there is a need to take care of them and to disciple them. But the Lord maintains the rights to them. They belong to him. Now, we cannot give ourselves more children. Again, that's the Lord's doing. I think sometimes people forget that. You know, this idea that they're going to have so, and so many children, whatever, and that's, they, they might get what they desire. They might have that or they might not. The Lord opens a womb. That's what the scripture says. I'm talking to someone just this afternoon about this very thing. We look, talk about sickness and ill health and you know, and it's true, people look at it and they say, well, some people are genetically predisposed to this illness and that illness, and you hear all the statistics and so on. Maybe so, maybe so. I have known many occasions where statistically they shouldn't have had what they had, but they had it. It happens. And why does it happen? Why does it happen? Other times they should get something and they don't get it. Why? Why? Who has made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or the blind? That's what God says to Moses. I do. I make all things. I'm in control of everything. The Lord gives children. He opens a womb. And he is pleased to advance his cause by giving us children at times. And we should pray like Hannah in 1 Simon chapter 1. Lord, give us more children. Give us more children. Give us more children in the physical sense. We should be thankful for that. Give us more children in the spiritual. I'll talk about this maybe later on. Um, as we review things a little bit more specifically. But um, there needs to be a desire to see 
to see people born, born again of the Spirit. And when the Lord shuts up the womb of the church, we should cry like Hannah. We should weep and lament. He has more children. He does. He is pleased to do that. And so sad it is whenever it doesn't happen. But he not only gives us those children, adds more children, he uses those children. That's what verse 4 tells us. He's going to use them. Children aren't given so that we can kind of put them on the shelf and admire them. <laughs> not that they would ever stay on the shelf anyway. But verse 4 tells us, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. God intends to use them. Maybe you've heard it said, we're not saved to sit, we're saved to serve. And each child has a purpose, every last one of them. Each child of God has a purpose. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, a man who is a warrior, a warrior who has arrows in his hand, again, it's not there for decoration, is it? He intends to use them if necessary. He has arrows that have a purpose. Now, arrows are a very interesting thing. It's interesting that it should use arrows. Why does it use arrows? Arrows take time to form and make, don't they? Back in those days, you have to get the right wood and you have to shape it and make sure it's straight as a die. And then you have to get the stone or the flint that, for the point and you have to find the right feathers. There's a whole constructing process for that thing. Because what's the point in making arrows that don't fly? They don't do what they're meant to do. So the whole process of, of making the arrows is a laborious task. A laborious task. It's not easy to do. But that's the picture that we're given. Arrows. Arrows in the hand of the mighty man. The mighty man who wishes to use arrows, to see arrows used in warfare, he must shape those arrows carefully, craft them, be diligent in every detail so that that arrow will do what it's intended to do come the time. Arrows are designed for what purpose? To hit a target. And to damage that target. To have an influence of, of destroying that target. To damage, even to kill. And that's exactly what children are give, given for, you know. Children are given for that purpose. Children are inheritors of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. They belong to him. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. We are to take our children and see them as arrows. And we shape them. Every day we're shaping them, whether we like it or not. I'm not just talking about being proactively teaching them. Of course, you're shaping them when you do that. But when you're not actively teaching them, you're also influencing them. And so every, there has to be a very diligent mindset toward our children. Now, I'm saying this to parents. But I want us to understand that even as a church... As a church, our children are watching. If you stand, <laughs> if, you st if, if, we're, if we're getting up to sing, and you, you're called to sing, you're called to stand and join and sing, and your singing is about as energetic as something that's moments from dying. I have visions, I have visions of something very strange by the way. You know, in Australia, you have these, what are called storm moths, right? It's kind of freakish. Every so often, I think it's around April or thereabouts, and you get rainfall. I mean, this is a place that hardly gets any rainfall at all. And you will get this heavy rainfall, and these storm moths will appear. And they appear in their droves. They're coming up out of the ground. And there's thousands of them. Thousands of them. We were at a prayer meeting one night. Melanie will remember. We were at the prayer meeting in one of the churches. And we had an 80 mile journey home again that night. The rain came down that evening and we're driving home. This, this is like a, there's one turn, the whole 80 miles. You drive for about 70, 60 miles and then you take a left turn and it's an hour 20 miles and you're home. It's, it's very straightforward driving there. But the moths, I could barely see out the windscreen by halfway through the journey. I was like just moth guts across the windscreen. And the next morning I went out and this massive moth about three or four inches long kind of stuck and jammed within one of the wiper blades that, of the car. And we were at the camp, the children's camp that they have there one year. And the same thing happened. We're at the camp and the rain comes on that evening and the moths come out. And they are massive, 
huge, like small birds, <laughs> really freaky. But see the next morning, the next morning, they're all on the ground flapping, gasping their last of life. And you come out and they'll just be making these kind of flappy kind of things and they're about to die and the ants are coming or the lizards are coming and everything's, you know, there's, there's plenty in Australia to make short work of all those moths. And I just, when I thought of that, this, that the, the kind of dead way in which that moth lies there after coming and showing all, and just flapping and looking so pathetic the next morning. Some people... In church, they're like those half-dead moths on the ground. They really are. There's no energy. There's no, ex- there's no giving. The- Children are watching. They are watching. If you're called to sing, let the children know that you're very deliberate in that. That you're lifting up your voice to God. That you're making it known that you delight in this God. You find pleasure in his gospel. That dead kind of worship, beloved, it ought not to be in any of our hearts. You say, I can't sing. I don't care. I don't care. Give gusto and energy. I love it. I love to see gusto. I love that person that's singing as if they're trying to make their lungs burst. Like, it's just so good to see. I always try to be that person. It's no good in a choir. It's no good in the, the choir master will have your head. You're, you're, you know, you're too loud. I remember someone looking at, I was in a choir brief, briefly at one time and saying, it's not very good. It's not because you're not meant to hear one voice in the choir. But in the congregation of the Lord, let it out. Sing with vigor. Let our children see that we love to praise the living God. We are teaching them all the time. In this congregation, Children are watching. They're watching you. You may not be their parent, but they're watching you. What message are you giving? Because here's the thing. We want them to be arrows in the hand of a mighty man. We want our children, one day, we let our children go. Inevitably, we do. We let our children go. They'll not always be ours. One time or another, we'll either encourage them to go, (laughs) or they will find their time when they go. And you might be hesitant, or you might be reluctant, or you might feel they're not ready, but they will be ready, and they will feel themselves ready, and they will go. They will go, and they will carve out life for themselves. And when that happens, even the few years prior to that, even the few years prior to that, your influence in their life has been greatly reduced. If you haven't already established the influence in their life long before they hit 16, you're going to have little influence after that. You'll have some influence. Sure you will. But it's when they're young. It's when you're crafting, when you're finding that right piece of wood, those feathers, that right point, that flint, that stone, and you're crafting it all. One day, one day, the Lord will take them. This is the desire that the mighty man will take our children and he'll place them in his bow and he will kill the enemy with them. That's the hope. I hope my daughters will grow up as precious stones in the house of God and that they will be mothers in Israel. And they will raise children to the glory that whatever children God may bless them with, they will have a mighty impact. I don't know. Maybe they'll raise a William Carey or an Adoniram Judson or a George Whitford. I don't know. But if I... If my investment, Melanie's investment in their life will shape their children and you're thinking down through the generations. Arrows. Arrows. It's what they are. Even the idea of arrows, you're not going to keep them. You're not going to keep them. They have to be shot. You might love that arrow. You say, it's a work of art. That arrow is a work of art. (laughs) But it's no good encased. It's no good. You might look at one of your children and say, they turned out well. (laughs) That one did okay. But they're not designed there for you to admire. They're designed for God to use and to send them out. We need children like this. Yes? 
Happy is that man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Yes, what influence they will have. You know, we come to the end of 2017. We'll talk more about this in just a moment, but it comes back to this. This work, this work as well as any work that belongs to God, is completely in his hands. Entirely, from beginning to end. Every possible level. There's no part of it that depends on us. None. Absolutely none. He builds his church. He protects his church. He adds children to the church. He uses them. And (laughs) when all is said and done, it's all him. It's all him. And the psalm reminds us of that. We are to be kingdom minded and we are to look for the building of the church, the extension of that kingdom and pray to that end. But what way can I get it home to you? To enter into this morning's message and to kind of combine the two messages. It is possible to live our lives in vain. It's a very real thing to live your life in vain. Laboring in vain. Watching in vain. Rising up early in vain. Doing all these things in vain. And we can't change what has passed as far as this year is concerned. But we can look to tomorrow and say, Lord, I know there's areas where I need to change so that my life has less vanity in it. It's less vanity. The Lord is worthy of it. I trust that he will give us much grace and he will help us and that we will go forward and that you will keep praying over even this psalm. Take this psalm and pray over it. Lord, build your house. Don't let our labor be in vain. Keep the city. Don't let our watching and preserving of it be in vain. Let our children be as arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Yes. May the Lord be pleased to do that. Let's bow together in prayer.